Welcome to Rider Nation Station, presented by American Manufacturing Solutions, your total logistic partner, investing in Rider Nation Station and St. Mary's, Ohio, and to our other fine sponsors. So here it is, the Alpha, the beginning, the inaugural broadcast of what I hope has no forthcoming Omega, as there is so much St. Mary's history, culture, lessons, and lore to capture. So how did RNS develop its roots to blossom to this vodcast you are viewing? Well, folks, it started with the first conversation I ever had with our first guest, which was sometime in October of 2018. I was fascinated and riveted by this individual's personal story and his reflections about St. Mary's, Ohio. This guest wasn't originally from St. Mary's, for that matter, not even from Ohio or from the United States of America. For 49 years, St. Marians have called him doctor, and it is my pleasure to have as our first guest, Dr. Alfredo Pagarigan. Dr. Pagarigan, thanks for being here. So, you're from the Philippines. Yes. Tell us you know, a little bit what it was like, your upbringing, uh, living in the Philippines, and uh, you know, I think that you even had to endure part of World War II as you were growing up. Um, um, Philippines uh, is a tropical country, and I was born in 1936. At that point, there was only one physician in town. And uh, although I enjoyed playing on the river, um, playing with a lot of kids, we have a lot of diseases. And in fact, when I was one year old, I had pneumonia, according to my mother, for seven months. And growing up, I had a lot of disease like parasitism, intestinal parasites. Um, I had dysentery. Um, I also had malaria later on, which my mother cured with one glass of something that she boiled out of a, a bark of a tree. Most likely, it's cinchona bark. Huh. And it never came back. Uh, and my cousin died from it, having a, uh, almost the same month, uh, having cerebral malaria. So um, my, uh, there was a lot of people I witnessed dying of different diseases, and nobody can do anything about it. We have a, no hospital. There was only one physician who was my distant cousin, and suddenly um, in 1941, um, I think December 8, there were hundreds of uh, Japanese planes and bombard town. That's the beginning of World War II. This was probably eight hours after they bombed uh, Pearl Harbor. And since then, we went to the mountains um, and hid there for four years. And hid there for four years? Four years, yes. Uh, so I, we didn't have any school. All I did was uh, play, uh, try to catch uh, pheasants, and, and go fish or get some shells. Catch pheasants by play. hand? No. I, I made my own trap out of strings and a, a guava, what they call guava brands. And it was so, ex I was so excited to see the pheasant go into my trap. <laughs> so, but I, we never ate that. My father always uh, releases any kind of animals that I had. Um, so you lived in the mountains. Were, were there caves that were in the mountains? Or? No, we, we usually, there are people in there. and. I don't know how my parents go about it, but they always offered us to stay in a house. Not one house, different houses, okay. different places. And uh, I went back to the town in a four, for a few months when the Japanese were there. But, and I witnessed um, um, like somebody 
what they call the Kempatai, which is a um, actually uh, Japanese prison. Okay. Early in the morning, my cousin and three other kids were sitting on the side of the road, and I saw a man all bloodied up with with a, with his arm, you know, strapped behind him, and. Those Japanese were cruel, really. And one time after the Bataan surrendered, there was there were Americans that were paraded in a uh, in a cage out of bamboo. But I, my father did not want me to see it, sure. so I never saw it. But everybody yeah. saw it. I don't know what happened to those guys. Um, so, so your upbringing was one of. Uh Lots of illness. A lot of illness, yes. And a lot of just major uh, travesty of war. Of war, yeah. And would you say, Dr. Pergarigan, that uh, that upbringing in some way fashioned you to become a medical doctor? Yes, because I saw a lot of deaths and illnesses. Mm -hmm. you know? My own father had a gastric ulcer and um, bled, and I saw him fall from second floor all the way down. That's the reason why I took gastroenterology at Ohio State. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and you have a map here of the Philippines. Uh, and so obviously it's a, an, a nation of many islands. Where, where was home for you, Dr. Pagarigan? Yes, um, it's way up here. It's called Tugegarao. I was watching uh, Jeopardy one time. Suddenly there was a question, what was the hottest a city in the world, and it was my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are 7,000 islands. This is 1,500 1, miles long. Now, Formosa is up here, around 500 miles, and Vietnam is around 700, I think, to the west. This is a valley. As you can see, there is a big river. Okay. There is a, a big seven um, ranges of mountains here called Sierra Madre. There are mountains here called Caraballo, and these are mountain province. These are where the headhunters are in Igorots. All the people in this country came from other countries. Okay. The first people that inhabited Philippines were uh, actually dwarf negritos, what we call negritos, but they are the um, dwarf from Africa. I don't know how they got there, but I think that during the, uh, um, in 19, in, or 30,000 years ago, there was ice age, sure. and I think they crossed over. There are three uh, people that nobody knows where they come from. One of them is Negritos, what they call, they're still there. And the other one is Australian Aborigines, mm -hmm. and there are Ainus of Japan. Up to now, they know they didn't know where it came from. Um, so it was easy for Japan to come and bomb us before they bomb uh, Clark Air Force Base, which is some some year right here. Okay. And of course, uh, December 12, the Japanese soldiers marched March. down to, and. Three days later on, I woke up in the morning because we were in the first barrio where we ran. There were gunshots and explosions. And there was one American guerrilla and two Filipinos attacked the, uh, the uh, airfield of the Japanese, killed all the Japanese and destroyed all the, the uh, planes Japanese planes, and then they escaped to the second district. The Japanese occupied only the first, this part of the country, okay. of the province. They didn't go this way. They were afraid of headhunters. Ah. As, uh, so. Okay. So, well, very, very interesting. If I did my math correctly, so from the age five to about eight or nine, yeah. you were in the mountains and the Japanese had occupied That's right. your hometown. Very, well, at the beginning, somebody burned our, our part of our town where our house was, 
And the Japanese, all they did is um, took somebody who was my neighbor, and I used to sit on his lap and, and had a public execution. Oh, dear. With a, with a sword. That's, that's without any kind of... Um, yeah. So, so again, you had an upbringing of, of devastation. And um, so I guess I'm going to lead into the next question of what, what was the reason for you emigrating from the Philippines to the United States of America? Well, if you know the Philippines, there's really not much work. It's not like here where you have companies and all that stuff. And when I became, uh, my father and my mom were very poor. Um, they had a small store. And I was, since I was sixth grade, I took care of that sometimes, you know, in their way. However, between clientele, um, my uncle came home with algebra book and a uh, physics book. And within one month or during that summer, I was able to solve all those uh, problems in, that, in those two books. And that really brought me to this uh, medical school. Our medical school is, was put up by this country, the United States, in, 2000, in 1902, 1902 okay. because there were so much, they found out that there were so much diseases in the, in the country. Right. So they put up a thousand bed hospital in a medical school, which is free. I don't know how they do it, however, the professors who are usually graduate from this hospital, from this country, uh, give their their time teaching kids free. They don't charge any kind of. And, I, and then from third year, fourth year, and internship, we work in that hospital. Third year we do the labs. Uh, fourth year we start seeing patients, supervised by the interns and the residents supervise the interns. Um, the, uh, this hospital is so busy. Sometimes we, we have almost more, more than 100 deliveries a night, and there are only three interns that cover that. 100 baby Deliver, deliveries? Yes. Wow. Night. Because it's 5,000, yeah. 5 million people in the city. So to the best of your knowledge, is this uh, hospital still around today? Or oh, yes. It, okay. And the school is still charging only like $300 or something per year. So if I have this right, you were actually a doctor before you attended medic medical school in the United States of America. Yes. Then. In 1964, there was a program by this country uh, equal and they call it ECFMG, which is uh, to attract my, uh, graduates from other countries. Mm -hmm. You have to take an exam, and if you score uh, high, you'll get, they'll, you can stay five years in this country. So when my five years, I came over with only $100 in my pocket. However, there was a work already ready for me at Hamilton, Ohio. Of course, I didn't know where Hamilton, Ohio <laughs> was. <laughs> I, I landed in Cincinnati, and then they took us by, uh, they took us in a limousine, and I was looking for skyscraper, but of course, I see cornfields. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, Hamilton was a very nice, small 400 beds hospital. And um, actually, we didn't have much training in there because the, the, the doctors themselves are nothing but general practitioners. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they call my opinion, you know, they ask my opinion how to treat a patient. And from there I went to Dayton, Dayton uh, VA. Okay. Dayton VA is a part of Ohio State. So on my second year down there, I rotated to Ohio State on the infectious disease, general medicine, and then I went back there for gastroenterology. Now it's funny because in the VA, I use the, what we call a flexible scope to look into the stomach, intestines um, for a year. And when I went to Ohio State, they were still using 
a primitive, what we call semi-flexible, it's a pipe, and then at the end is a rubber. And it was so difficult to look at. Uh, and I did the first endoscopy with a flexible scope at Ohio State. I showed the department how to, to use it. And I also uh, introduced a small needle biopsy of the liver down there. Um, so for three months that I was there, um, they uh, asked me to do it. Um, so if I have this right, at Ohio State, you introduced the first endoscopy, endos endoscopy uh, to the medical team yes, there. To, to the department. OK. Interesting. And, uh, Very interesting. And now they are huge. Right. Yeah. So. Excellent. So you were a doctor, but by, not by the United States standards. So you had to do this additional training. What, was it through Ohio State or? Actually, our training. Now, you have to know that our train, that uh, our College of Medicine was put up by this country and they patterned it after Harvard. Okay. So our training is really, uh, compared to where I was here in this country, uh, it's, you know, I think we had a better training. Gotcha. Than, um, however, we have to undergo uh, residency here. And in 1969, the government, this country asked me to get get out of the country because I I finished my five years uh, stint or stay, and uh, we were already. I was there was a hospital in in Nome, Alaska, where I was. They they told me I can go up there and practice there, but I didn't know it was how cold that country is. <laughs> uh, Soon found out, huh? No, I didn't go. Oh, you did not go? No. Uh, just before I have, you know, we were packing, uh, Dr. Skagg, who was a surgeon here in this town, I don't think you know him. No. Um, knows uh, the president of Ohio Medical Association. And he went there and talked to him so that I can take my boards. Because in 69, you have to be a citizen to take the board and also to practice. So when I took my board, luckily, it was what we call a flex system for the first time. And flex system means that it's clinical. It's not basic, like anatomy and all that. So I, that's the reason why I was number three, because I just had training. Um, okay, and what, what you uh, are referring to there is something that I found in the Evening Leader, February 12th of 1970, which was the announcement of Dr. McGarrigan mm -hmm. coming to St. Mary's mm -hmm. to open up an office. And uh, what I found very interesting is what you just referenced there, that you had the third highest score on the, the medical exam for the state of Ohio. Ohio. Is that correct? That's correct. And... So you're the third highest score, and you're recruited to come to St. Mary's, Ohio, in a joint township. But, you know, how did how did that all occur? Well, Was it Dr. Skag? the Skag grew me, and I accepted it because at that point in my I had three, two sisters and one brother in in college, and my mom. Oh, I didn't mention that my father died during my my the first day of my internship. Okay. At that point. I said to my mother, he said, don't send me any money. But I found out that the food in, in our Philippine General Hospital was awful. So I lost maybe 16, 20 pounds, and I starved. So at my graduation, I said, I want to go and earn money. Uh, <laughs> and U.S. was perfect. And although the, the salary was only 11,000, but you multiply that by 60 pesos, that's big money already. Yes, yeah. yes. So what was your first impression when you come to St. Mary's? I, I came from a small town, all right? And, and it, it, it's similar. Our town is similar to this. And um, of course, during that time, there was a lot of discrimination. Believe it or not, I learned about discrimination only when I came to this country. We don't have discrimination at home, and we have almost any, na most nationality that you can 
we have Jewish people, we have colored people, we have Indians, Chinese, Filipinos, Americans, Germans, but we didn't pay attention to color or anything like that. Interesting. And also, it's interesting because when I came over, uh, women were very scarce in medicine. I mean, in 1900s, there were more women in, my, in the Philippines going to school. In fact, the first, I think the, one of my professors was in Harvard and was teaching us in the, and he was the first, according to, he was the first woman, of course. And, um, but women, there were more women in college than men in my time. Hmm. Uh, so it's, you know. Uh, so, so you mentioned a little bit about discrimination and, and that more women in college in the Philippines versus what you saw here. This was the question when we talked back in October that really was the impetus. Um, I remember my sister Laura stating to you before this question that you have such interesting information, you need to write it down. I think your quick answer was, I don't write. Um, and, and we said, well, we've got other ways we can do this, and here we are. But this question's when I said, you know what? We, we, gotta, we gotta do this Writer Nation Station vodcast. And the question went something like this. Uh, Dr. Bergerigan, what was it like coming to St. Mary's in early 1970 as a Filipino to a community that's 99% white, it's a very small rural conservative town. So can you walk us through you coming from uh, Columbus, I think, is where you no, last were? I was were. in Dayton. Well, you were in Dayton, then to St. Mary's. You know, uh, in Dayton, the other thing that happened, I was walking in downtown Dayton, and a fellow comes in and said, are you a Chinese cook? And that <laughs> changed my mind. I said, I'm going to a small town. <laughs> <laughs> At least they know me. Uh, and I, I felt, I felt, I mean, I didn't feel any, I, I was happy here. I was, I didn't feel any discrimination, even if they discriminate because I'm brown, I know who I am. You know, I was, right. I was, you know, I was number three in the, yep. in the board, I'm number four in the Philippines. Uh, and so I, it doesn't matter to me, you know, I was, uh, so, so people, once you opened up your, uh, your Practice. office at the Barton Medical Center, which is that where you yes, were your entire time? Yeah. Um, time, and people came. Well, people came right away, yes. And a funny part of that, you know, the hospital has only, you know, it was a letter L cement covered, and there are beds and one nurse's station. They didn't do any, they didn't take care of any uh, really sick people. They always transferred them to, when I came, of course, I started taking care of sick people. I also started doing peritoneal dialysis in 1970 in this hospital. Uh, uh, Lama was not doing it. That's why I've done it here. It's called wow. emergency. And in 1974, I put up the coronary care unit because every week there are at least two people dead on arrival with heart problem, from, especially from Goodyear. So hmm. I put up the intensive care unit, and some doctors were not happy about it because they said they were not, they they don't I, they would not know what to do with it. But I headed that for ten years at least until a gastro or cardiac um, or cardiologist came in. Um, and then in 1975, someone in Lima bought me a a flexible scope to do scope in St. Rita's, Lamb Memorial, Sydney, Coldwater, and two hospitals in Salina. In Salina. You remember Otis and uh, mm -hmm. Gibbons? And would you believe, I not, it was very rare that I do one in St. Mary's, <laughs> 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 except my patients. <laughs> uh, so, so that's very interesting. So you come here in 1970, and with a, just a, a handful of years, you're introducing a lot of uh, more advanced, advanced. medical uh, techniques and practices yes. that our residents and, and from the area don't have to go to Lima or to Dayton, probably, yes. or Fort Wayne. 
So you kind of left a, a major mark on, on our town in that regard. Yeah, the first uh, kidney transplant was my patient. Um, I don't know whether I need to, to name, okay. Um, so, the, in fact, he called me and he says, can I have something for gout? I said, his doctor was away. I said, why? Uh, I said, doctor so-and-so give me always this when I have gout. Did you do a test on your blood? I said, no. And I did test on blood. He didn't have any kidneys. And that was the first transplant. I'll be darned. And so, so, <laughs> <laughs> they used to do things with that. You know, <laughs> uh, so kind of transitioning here from things went well, really pretty well for you being received and accepted and mm -hmm. patients coming and introducing new techniques and practices at the hospital. Were there any uh, families that helped you kind of get grounded here in St. Mary's and get settled and know, you know, where to go and, and, and what to do? Yeah, um, we, we, um, we rented a house uh, from this street, going with, I, I don't know, the West, West Street? West, West, West South, Street? West South or something. Okay. First, they refused to uh, rent it to me because I had a big uh, uh, dog. So we put it, you know, I built a, uh, a fence. And, and fence. And, and then finally, with, my, with the people that helped me here, they convinced the owner to go ahead and, you know, rent it to me. Um, the, the people that, of course, Dr. Bowling was, and Dr. The, the editor, and uh, what's her name? Editor of the paper here? Oh, Casey Geiger. Casey Geiger. And the Van Der Horses, okay. Jerry and Tom, and Davises. Um, Jim and Louise. Jim and Louise, and Makimbo. In fact, I went to this uh, bank, this white. The old home savings bank, home probably. Saving, to ask for $5,000 to uh, start my practice, and they refused to give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mark and Bo talked to bank, second bank, second national bank, or uh, who it's now the Chase. Okay. And the first national first bank. First national bank. Or it was second. Second? Oh. Yeah, that's second. They said, go for it. And if you want to build your house, go for it. So coming from a one-room house in my country, I found a three acres on the lake, and it was very cheap. And I built a big home, and that kept me here. You know, kept me here. I, I didn't want to leave and because they want me in Lima and Sydney. Yes. I said, no. In fact, you know, one doctor from Lima who was trying to recruit me came to our house and he looked around and says, ah, stay here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad that he did. And was it Bill Mockenball? Yeah, Bill Mockenball. So and basically uh, the bank went off the word of Bill Mockenball that you uh, were well, he knew credit worthy and needed to be given the money. Well, he knew my professor at Ohio State. Okay. And according to him, I, I don't want to say something that the professor said, because like I'm busting, you know, but that, that um, he told the bank to just go ahead and give it to me. Uh, it's only 5,000 bucks, you know. Yeah. Well, thank goodness for Bill Mockenball and for the Vanderhorst and Casey Geiger. Casey and, Geiger, uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Bowling. Dr. Bowling and the Davises for kind of helping shepherd you along to, uh, you know, establish your mark here on St. Yeah. Mary's and the surrounding I, area. I, I don't mind coming to a small town. You, I've seen more pathology in this town and other towns uh, than if I stayed in Dayton. Because the serious cases in a big, you know, in a big uh, city, they go to specialists. Right. Here, I'm the only one. Yep. You, you know, they come and when I see a serious case, I always go back to the books, to research. That's how I learned all these years. Took care of it, you know what I mean? Uh, and uh, so, I kind of enjoy, and there's a lot of congenital diseases in, this, in the small towns. 
And, you know, we're going to talk about that after we uh, take a little commercial break, and uh, we're going to come back with this day in history and then resume the uh, second half of the interview okay. with Dr. Pagari again. Investing in the St. Mary's community is American Manufacturing Solutions, your total logistic partner. Albert Sporting Goods, 121 West Spring Street, serving the St. Mary's community since 1980. Plus One Professional Real Estate, selling St. Mary's from the corner of Spring and Chestnut since 1982. Minster Bank, helping people achieve financial success and supporter of the Ryder Nation and St. Mary's community. The Evening Leader, chronicling the history of St. Mary's for over 100 years. All righty, we're back from that commercial break and bringing you This Day in History. This day in history is April 2nd, 1970. We're to commemorate the year Dr. Pagarigan arrived to St. Mary's. This day in St. Mary's history, hospital news, 69 total patients, 21 male adults, 40 female adults, one child and seven infants. Unfortunately, there were two deaths. Making the headlines, Joe Whitney, St. Mary's Rural Route elected president of Ohio Young Farmers will seek to enlarge membership. Whitney states Ohio now has 65 chapters and total membership of 1,169. He also states that he is hoping to organize a new chapter in the St. Mary's area and another one in the Mercer County area. Also making headlines, collection of census forms progresses well. Mrs. Jane Cooper, census crew leader, stated her and her enumerators are most appreciative of the cooperation they are getting from the householders. And the final headline, documentary film on Antarctica conquest includes polar pioneers Cook and Bird. This living history in the classroom is made available without charge to junior and senior high school students in the area as a public service by the St. Mary's plant of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Thank you to the following sponsors for helping to bring this day in history. Well, Dr. Bergerigan, Kind of interesting, this day in history, on April 2nd, 1970, 69 patients, 21 were adult males, 40 were adult females. Was that kind of a typical day, do you recall? Was that crowded in the hospital at that time? And that's before the three extra stories were added as well. Um, if I remember right, um, they expanded a little bit to the west of the existing building. And so, yeah, that was typical of that. It could also be um, during, um, like, like uh, virus infections, where there's so many people. During that time, uh, any kind of minimal, like virus infections, gastroenteritis, Mis or not measles, uh, flu, they get uh, admitted. Uh, nowadays, you cannot do that because of uh, insurance. Um, you have to have the insurance. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, that was kind of a game changer in it's, all, uh, yeah, all practice, the practice. So right before we took that commercial break, you were talking about uh, some, some prevalent illnesses that you found in small towns. So let, let's kind of highlight that a little bit, if you don't mind. What, what were some of those illnesses or diseases that did have prevalency in the St. Mary's area? Um, this includes uh, other surrounding area. Um, uh, blood diseases like lymphomas. There's a lot of cancer here. And I found two people with very rare disease. It's called porphyria. Um, in two women, um, and uh, a lot of autoimmune diseases, and I, I and heart problems. There's a lot of uh, congenital heart problems. Um, some doctors explain that because of in a small town they tend to intermarry. You know, it's, um, uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So enough to keep a doctor busy for 49 years, okay. uh, no problem. No problem okay. at all. How, 49 years, that's, that's outstanding, that's amazing. How has the medical practice changed since medical school to your retirement? 
stay, when I first came in and the first few years, uh, we physicians practice with pure academic freedom. That means that you can treat a patient according to your knowledge and, and all that, and no interference. Nowadays, there is insurance company, there is hospital people, there is uh, other doctors uh, who, who do not know your, your technique can, you know, criticize you. And, and also, most hospitals nowadays are business oriented. Um, yep. And there's not much you can do about it. Yep. And, and technology has to just technology. never be changing and, and hard to, to stay on top of. But you brought technology to the hospital in 1970 as well. The problem with technology is that almost, the di almost everybody I know nowadays, they don't use their stethoscope. They don't use their senses, their fingers, which a doctor should apply before ordering an, you know, a, uh, any kind of x-rays and MRIs or anything like that. You can make a diagnosis talking to a patient and just listening. And mm -hmm. Nowadays, they type, and they, they, don't, they don't analyze what the patient is talking about. You know what I mean? Uh, record, sure. good record. Uh, I studied uh, I s one patient was admitted from the emergency room, and when he arrived in the floor, I looked at 25 pages of report, and I didn't, I didn't get what the patient was coming in for, or what the doctor was thinking. I mean, it's all about, did you come from Africa? Did you have, uh, how many, whether they, you have dentures? What time he was transferred from wheelchair to the bed? Uh, there are no clinical, <laughs> it doesn't help at yeah. all. So things have definitely changed. Have definitely changed. Things have definitely changed. To the, not, not quite as you would like to see, to see that. Yeah, that's right. We'll, we'll put it that way. Um, so you talked a little bit about uh, having the house on the lake, uh, and uh, that's one of the things that kept you here for the, you know, the, the 50 years that yeah. uh, you've been here. Um, what did you enjoy most about Grand Lake St. Mary's? Early in the morning, you drink coffee and you watch the sun rise and the glittering uh, reflection on the lake and the eagles and the birds and the geese and the ducks. But don't, you know, I never swim on that lake. <laughs> <laughs> it's good now because there is a uh, sis, uh, sewage system. When I first arrived, all the toilet open or the bleach pad open to the lake. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing that the, uh, yeah, the lake has can, been sewered uh, yeah, yeah. nowadays. It's really... Yeah. Cleaning up. Yeah, um, yeah. What was there anything that you did not like about Grand Lake St. Mary's? Living on Grand Lake St. Mary's. No, no. I, I, oh well. I was. I think small tornado came our went over mm -hmm. our house because it goes around the lake. You know, uh -huh. it, it cannot cross the lake. It goes around it, and two of those came over our house, destroyed, and. Um, You'd be surprised. I can never understand what it does to a. I had a uh, aluminum ladder against a tree. After the tornado, it was down on the ground, and it was twisted. Ah, it's Just twisted. Twist. Yes. How did it do that? You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's something. Yep. Uh, yeah. How how has uh, lake life changed since you first moved to now? Um. And, well, it's improving, uh, especially with the presence of the eagles. So a lot of people are, you know, coming. And I talked to to um, Mr. Cook, the realtor here, mm -hmm. and all the houses prices are going up. And a lot of people from Dayton are coming back. Good. So 
Um, yeah, that's one of the things that uh, through the Lake Restoration Commission, Milt Miller used to state the lake is coming back, and so should you. So that's that's good to hear that uh, you you know because there was a lot of investment from the Dayton area, Dayton area, uh, yeah, for summer homes or a second home on the lake. Yeah. So that's great that uh, that is happening. They've been dredging, um, so. Well, the other thing that I was thinking is they should put a, something in the middle of a lake and then dreads put the, the, what they dreads over there and then plant like wild flowers of Ohio, mm. trees to attract the, the birds and the, the eagles. And that would be an attraction to, sure. to people coming here, you know, in boat. Um, well, a lot, lots of plans for the lake uh, th throughout many, many decades, and uh, you know things are definitely improving, and that's good to see, and hopefully it maintains that. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, what, when our, we talked in October, you mentioned something about being referenced in two movies. Well, um, even maybe slightly, but Nan Davies, I was the physician who came to the family. You know who Nan Davies? Yes, and broke his back, her back came out and told the family that he will never heal. And in the movies, I was present, I was represented by a Vietnamese, I think, if you watch the movie. I think the movie was called First Steps. First Steps, yeah. And then I have the, uh, when I was in the VA, I met a girl there who was the daughter of the president of Iron Mine, oh, no, U.S. Steel or something like that. Okay. He was killed in, in a, a New Year's in the 60s. Three people came in and shot, shot three of them. Was, was this the Yablonsky, the Yablonsky murders? Yes. So I, it was uh, New Year's Eve 1969, 1969, I believe. That girl was my... Uh, so the I daughter of... Yablonsky. Yablonsky was your girlfriend. In the, in the VA. And, uh, but she didn't. 69, I was married already. She didn't know that. <laughs> she mentioned, well, maybe it was when the movie was shot, maybe they were referring to 1970 or 65, 66, because she says she was going back to Ohio. Oh, okay. She didn't so years back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, you're, you're two more movies than me. <laughs> oh, that was just an accident. Really. <laughs> Uh, and obviously glad that you didn't get tangled up in, in that. New I Year's was invited Eve to their house, and being in the war, maybe I could have survived, because I always take precautions, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's you know, yeah, especially in isolated house that they have in the woods. I would have taken, you know, yeah, precautions. Yeah. And what's interesting is I was flipping through uh, the uh, evening leaders in the 1970s to look for an article about you. Um, the Yablonsky murders are what's referenced that? quite a few times uh, with uh, the AP or the UPI, the IPI, what yeah. syndicated, um, given the updates as the trials were going on. So a very interesting nexus between Dr. Bergerigan and the Yablonsky murders in the paper. Kind of an Maybe a goofy question, but if you could go back right now to 1970s, Dr. Pagarigan, what would you tell him? Tell myself? Yeah. Tell myself. Um, actually, I didn't have a choice. I had to come here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know anything about uh, St. Mary's, and I'm glad uh, to come here because it's a small town. There were no physicians with my training mm -hmm. and so I was free and I had a lot of patients right away and uh, and I was also going to several hospitals adjacent hospitals because I was the only one who could use the scope yep. during that time which meant that you hardly had any free time whatsoever that's right that's that's probably why I was not active in any service club clubs service and, clubs and all that yeah and the yeah. Centennial was going on in 1973, and you probably didn't have much time for any of that celebration either because yeah. you're 
and all well, the hospitals and treating all the patients. Well, on top of that, I have to uh, deliver babies too. So I have to cover Dr. Bowling. And yep. finally I said, ah, I might as well deliver babies. And I was not supposed to because of my training. But as I said, we delivered so many babies in the Philippines that I was not afraid to. Sure. During that time, we didn't, we didn't, we delivered everything, twins, breach, and well, we didn't do any C-sections. No, every time they do C-sections. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess the, the last question uh, for you is, uh, you know, you, you come in 1970 and you retire from the medical profession in 2007. Seven. 2017, 10. 17, and you're still here. I satisfied? Still, satisfied, and I still want to go back. You still want to go back to the medical to the, profession? Uh, the reason for that, I just saw somebody today came to the house asking second opinion or something. Ah. I still, I, simple, simple stuff, like, for example, a, a, somebody from New Bremen was, had a surgery on the heart, and she kept flowing at a f with fluid for 47 days. He, she was in the, she was kept in the ICU and she was seen by six specialists. So the family, when they told the family, take her home because she's dying. The family came crying to me and I said, okay, I'll go there tomorrow, tomorrow, which is Friday. I drove there, all she needed was a water pill. And she came home three days later. Hmm. You know how much 47 days in ICU? Sure. <laughs> and six specialists. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 simple stuff like that. They, they tend, it's most, it's, it's uh, being missed nowadays. They, they think too much about, um, you know, um, MRIs and, without even interviewing the patient, you know, and mm -hmm. looking at the simple stuff that's going on with the body. Yep. For example, if your blood pressure goes up, they give you medicine for blood pressure. You don't know what causes the blood pressure. You have to know that first so that you have to tailor what medicine you have to give. See, that's the problem. Right. Not, um, well, Dr. Pagarigan, that's uh, the, the end of the interview questions. We're going to go to a commercial break. And obviously, to the viewers, you can see that Dr. Pagarigan has left a, a major legacy on St. Mary's and Joint Township uh, District Memorial Hospital. And I thank you for your 49 years of service. When we come back, we're going to do a word association activity about St. Mary's, Ohio. Investing in the St. Mary's community is American Manufacturing Solutions, your total logistic partner. Albert Sporting Goods, 121 West Spring Street, serving the St. Mary's community since 1980. Plus One Professional Real Estate, selling St. Mary's from the corner of Spring and Chestnut since 1982. Minster Bank, helping people achieve financial success and supporter of the Ryder Nation and St. Mary's community. The Evening Leader, chronicling the history of St. Mary's for over 100 years. Alrighty, thank you to our fine sponsors for bringing Ryder Nation Station's Word Association activity. as. Dr. Pagarigan is our first guest. He's the first one to participate in St. Mary's Word Association. So he's going to see on the screen flash something related to St. Mary's, Ohio, and he's going to have to come up with the first thought that he has about what he sees. So thank you to those sponsors. Stop in and see those fine folks and stay local the best you can. Tell them thanks for supporting Rider Nation Station. You ready, Dr. Pagarigan? Yes. All right, here we go. Cooks. Restaurant, Cooks. first thing. Well, they, uh, we eat there a lot, um, especially during Christmas. Um, um, they, uh, I think their best recipe there was, um, what was that? Um, prime rib and prime garlic rib. salad come That's to my prime mind. Rib. That's right. And, uh, yeah, we all, we, sometimes we, we had a uh, Christmas party down there. Okay. Here comes the next one. So Ohio gas stations. Stations? There were three actually in St. Mary's. St. Mary's. Oh. Hmm. Do you remember where? 
Any of those would have been located? Yes, uh, I think it's in front of the uh, of Dr. Uh, Dr. Dozier. Dozier's. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's where I think my car. Uh, uh, they also look at cars down there. What yep. I think. Yeah. Yep. And here comes the next. Oh. That's, KTDMH. That's where I. That's primarily the reason I came. And I was there, spent 49 years. Neely's Drug Store. I, that is the number one attraction in St. Mary's, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love um, their apple pie. And ice cream, I think they, they had ice cream in there. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, woman who cooked the apple pie, he's, her son was in my hometown as, as a youth exchange. Okay. And my sister gave him a party when she left to this country. All righty. So there we have it. That's the first ever Rider Nation Station Word Association activity, and Dr. Bergerigan nailed it. Thanks so much for uh, participating, and again, thanks to those fine sponsors for bringing Rider Nation Station's Word Association. Interactive correspondence is what we will go to next. Since this is the first one, we don't have any correspondence from our viewers. But what we do ask is if you would comment on the YouTube uh, station about this uh, show that you're watching right now. Next week, we'll talk a little bit about that. Or you can also send email to writernationstation at gmail.com. We at Writer Nation Station desire viewers to communicate with the podcast to corroborate what has been shared, provide a different version or spin to what has been shared to make this as interactive and informational as possible. With collective minds working together, history and the present can be connected for future generations. Lastly, we're going to do something every week that's called Rider Nation Station Special Artifact or Memorabilia. Each show we want to jar memories of our viewers with some artifact or memorabilia that may be special to St. Marion's. In the Rider Nation YouTube comments section, please provide any memories you have related to this show's special artifact and memorabilia. So here we go with the very first one. Who remembers this? If this sparks any memory whatsoever, please put your comments in the YouTube Rider Nation Station channel comments section. Well, we've come to the end of our first show. It's our hope at Rider Nation Station. This podcast did entertain, educate, enlighten, and elevate your perspective about St. Mary's, Ohio. We hope a story has been told that augments the development of relationships, old and new, to promote growth for all who do, did, and will call St. Mary's, Ohio home. If you're sitting there amazed by what you just saw and are asking yourself, how can I help to keep Rider Nation Station thriving, we have four simple suggestions for you. One, share the Rider Nation Station YouTube channel with your friends and family and be certain to, to click subscribe. Two, submit ideas to us in comments section or writernationstation at gmail.com. Three, support our sponsors with business or kind words. And four, donate to Rider Nation Station. Again, I want to thank Dr. Pagarigan for his time and sharing his stories with us. Next week, we will talk with Coach Jeff Janitis, reminiscing about the 1992-1993 Boys Basketball State Semifinal Run. Tune in next week for episode number two. I hope you think positively about our town, the town we didn't inherit from our ancestors, but the town we borrowed from our grandchildren. Peace to you, my fellow St. Marians, always and always. Investing in the St. Mary's community is American Manufacturing Solutions, your total logistic partner. Albert Sporting Goods, 121 West Spring Street, serving the St. Mary's community since 1980. Plus One Professional Real Estate, selling St. Mary's from the corner of Spring and Chestnut since 1982. Minster Bank, helping people achieve financial success and supporter of the Rider Nation and St. Mary's community. The Evening Leader, Chronicling the history of St. Mary's for over 100 years.